10 weeks, Donald John Trump will re-enter the White House as the 47th president of the United States. He won an election of which saw most of the country move to the right. Trump's administration is already beginning to take shape. His campaign manager, Susie Wiles, has been named White House Chief of Staff. Now Democrats are regrouping, trying to figure out what comes next for them after such a stunning defeat. And everyone is wondering and waiting to see what the next four years will bring for the country. Which Donald Trump are we getting? With that, let's bring in our nightcap, and it is a fantastic one. Peter Baker is here in the flesh. He has legs. I've seen them. Chief White House Correspondent for The New York Times, Christina Greer, joins us. Associate Professor of Political Science at Fordham University. Eddie Glaude, Princeton University Professor and MSNBC contributor. And Pablo Torre, ESPN analyst and host of the Meadowlark Media's Pablo Torre Finds Out podcast. All right. Eddie, I turn to you first. Donald Trump did even better this election than the two previous ones, and a whole host of other Republicans won. What changed? Uh, what changed? Um, I'm not sure. What was revealed um, is that the country, uh, a large number of folks in the country, actually hold views consonant with Donald Trump. That the toxic brew of selfishness and greed and hatred, uh, which threaten uh, our democracy is in full view. This ain't Russia. This is us. And so there's an alignment between Donald Trump and the American voting public. And we have to come to terms with what that means. So it's not about why did Kamala Harris lose. The question is, the better question is, why are we the way we are as a country? But for a lot of people, they would say it's economic anxiety. That's BS. They, okay, hold on. They would say it's economic anxiety. And we saw incumbent parties across the world come out of power in the last three years. Because for most of us, we have never seen a spike in inflation like this in our lifetimes. You say baloney. No, D Donald Trump didn't enter the political uh, sphere on the basis of economic populism. He's been fighting the culture wars 3.0, 4.0, 5.0 since he came down those escalators. That's where he has made his money in politics, is really stoking grievance and hatred. And, you know, we heard this same argument around the Tea Party when they were engaged in those AstroTurf uh, protests. It's really about economic. And then the data came out and showed that the, econ the economic stuff was just simply a kind of variable that's, you know, that was tied to, tethered to a kind of deep racial anxiety about demographic shifts. It's BS because we don't want to confront what the hell it means for us to have elected a convicted felon. Correct. Who has also been held liable for sexual assault. Also correct. Who's a pathological liar. True. True. Yes. Right. And who by very, by all standards is a 78 year old man who is a hard 78. <laughs> right, not an easy one. And the fact that the American public would choose him as the president over an obvious competent, an obviously competent opponent, um, suggest that there was something else going on besides economic anxiety. How would you describe this election? Was it one for the bros? Was it Dems losing the Latino vote? Suburban women for Trump? Or eggs and bacon cost too damn much? Yeah, I come from the world of sports, and so I'm familiar with talking to, to bros, to dudes. Um, to and me, Democrats aren't used to talking to them, at least not in the last few years. That's right. Um, but I want to actually go a little bit more broad about this, because Eddie just mentioned uh, how Donald Trump is a pathological liar, which is true. We are at a point, I think, in American history where it has never been easier to mistake authenticity for honesty. Bingo. These are not the same things. Authenticity is a seemingly sincere presentation of what it seems like your character is. But what if your character authentically is that of a scammer? Mm. What if it's that of a con man? And I think we can talk and we should talk about democracy and systems and the institution as a premise that has been undermined as a result of not just this election, but the years, the eight years leading up to it. But I think that we are at a point where people are yearning for what feels like authenticity. And this is the through line through why is podcasting so popular? Why is politics as a premise itself so unpopular? Because it feels definitionally, Steph, inauthentic. And so Donald Trump, in his authentic dishonesty, is getting away 
with doing something that is just scamming people. Okay, but I actually think this is a brilliant point, okay? Because just think, and I'm, I'm in no way defending him or it, but Donald Trump sat down with Joe Rogan for three hours. And in those three hours, I am sure he spouted lie after lie after lie. But, but there's this thing that people feel in this authentic rawness of absurdity that they see him. Compare that, and I turn to you, when you and I have to cover the White House. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I interviewed President Biden a year ago, mm -hmm. and I was given 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And when I went to 13 minutes, it was like, a, it was right. like a, a national incident that all of NBC got put in the penalty box. I interviewed Kamala Harris six weeks ago, and I got 15 minutes. And when I pushed it to 25, it was like I won Powerball. Yeah. So, so there, is, there is something to be said of yeah. this raw authenticity that's filled with garbage and lies. Yeah but that people are buying into because they feel like it's real. Yeah. Now, if you go to his rallies, which I've gone to many over Lucky. the years, yes, mm -hmm. what you hear from people there is, yeah, I know what he's saying is probably not true or maybe not exact or get the details wrong, but it just feels like he's speaking to me, right? He's channeling me. Now, that's a remarkable thing for a guy who lives in a gilded triplex, uh, however many floors above uh, Manhattan and has a private plane and all that kind of stuff to be able to say mm -hmm. he can channel everyday people, including you know, rural Americans and black Americans and Latino Americans and women, uh, at least white women, uh, who would <laughs> really not anything like his lifestyle. And yet, at least in those rallies and obviously among a certain percentage of the electorate, uh, he does feel authentic. And again, it may be authentically dishonest, but it feels it, they care more about that and they think that we're just nitpicking when we say, well, you well, said this and it's not true. Christina, where do we put this? I heard a pundit <coughs> said, well, Democrats need to retrench and they have to learn that they cannot run on defund the police right. and gender fluidity. And here's my issue with that. They're not <laughs> running <laughs> on that. <laughs> when were they running? So, so what, where do, what do you do with that? Yeah. Listen, Donald Trump sells a certain brand of white freedom. And he dangles his con artist, snake oil salesman, Talus, in front of folks to say, well, you can get it, too. He's been in our political imagination for 30-plus years. He keeps saying he's successful, so people believe he's successful. He goes on Joe Rogan for three hours with very little pushback, and just the more he says things, they just become true. Okay, the, but you know the goalpost so moves for him constantly. Constantly. But what you said that's interesting is, I'm going to dangle this, this what, white freedom, did yeah. you call it? And you can too. So, so when I'm going, how did he peel off more black voters? How did he peel off the Latino voters? Because he's saying you too could have, that. he's selling this idea that I'm not offering support programs. What I'm offering you is, is you too can be rich yeah. and successful. But like, let's also be clear because yes, the Democrats will reshuffle. No, the black men did not move the way Donald Trump and the data, you know, the data is saying they did not move, right? The pundits are saying they moved. When we're disaggregating the data, black men didn't move. Latino men moved, white women stayed where they always stay with white men. But if the Democrats have to reshuffle so much, why is it that the Democratic senators in Michigan and Wisconsin and Arizona did just fine? Why is it that North Carolina ran the table for the Democrats as far as governors and lieutenant governors? The problem was the top of the ticket for some people who cannot will not, nor ever will they be able to pull the lever for a woman, for a person of color, but definitely not a woman of color. Now, did we hope and believe that Kamala Harris would be able to take it over the finish line? Yes, we have to. That's, we live, I'm a black woman in America. If I can't believe in things that I can't see, then what is the point of being in this country, right? So we have to think about Shirley Chisholm from 68. The, the larger issue of this country is completely ahistoric. So some people are shocked and surprised. They thought that 2016 was some sort of odd anomaly. Mm. 2024 shows us this isn't a Donald Trump problem. This is an America problem. This country does not understand nor respect its really sordid history. We've only been voting with the full protection of the law since 1965, right? This, and that's been eroded. The Civil Rights Act of 64 eroded. 65 Voting Rights Act eroded. 65 Immigration Act eroded. So these are all rel relatively new concepts. So the fact that folks are like, I can't believe this isn't us. This is us. My mom went to segregated schools. So did my dad. 
and they're still spunky 76 year olds. Like, this is. They're like, not a hard 76. They are not a hard, not a hard 76. My mother is a fabulous 76, <laughs> as is my dad. And so the thing is, these are young people in my family that have a very real history in this country, that we sort of pretend that that's like the Frederick Douglass, the Sojourner Truth history, as if people know who Sojourner Truth is because we don't believe in books. But, you know, the, the racism, the vitriol that we are seeing and that we will see that Donald Trump has excavated is not so far in the past. All these people are still alive mm. who sort of help promote segregation. They're still in positions of power, and a lot of them are chomping at the bit to be in this new administration because he has promised that we can take it back to the good old days where he doesn't have to have to deal with women or the blacks or, you know, all the immigrants he thinks are the same, except for if they're from Europe or the North. I have a feeling you don't need me to ask a question, and you probably have a comment. No, oh, I, <laughs> I was just sitting here thinking, you know, about all of the young folk who have to come of age in the midst of this. Right? The way in which the nation kind of continuously makes the choice that it made at its founding that confounds the republic. Each year, it's like almost each generation, it almost seems as if we have a chance to actually put something behind us and we do it again. And see, I think it's really important for us to kind of understand that white men don't have a monopoly on selfishness. White women don't have a monopoly on greed, right? Nor do they have a monopoly on hatred. So when we look at all of these folk who voted for Donald Trump, and some of them are Latino men, some of them are black men, right? We're a country that has been overrun by selfishness. We have no sense of the public good. We're a country that thinks that all of us at any moment we will hit the lotto and we're going to become rich. We can become what Donald Trump is. And you have these folk. I mean, I, there was one meme. There was this one thing on, on, on TikTok which said if you had it out, you, could, you would get $10 million or you would solve poverty across the globe. Which would you do? I'll take the $10 million. And you just go, damn, who raised you?